join Forum IS Academy, trusted by hundreds of toppers, including IS Rank 1 Shruti Sharma. Good evening aspirants, welcome to the Hindu News Analysis Discussion brought to you by Forum IAS for the date 6th April 2023. These are the list of news articles for today's discussion, aspirants can have a look at it. So for today we will be covering 5 topics from international relations, science, economics and a topic from agriculture. So with this straight away let us move to the first article of the day. First article, the takeaway from UN World Water Conference. This news article is regarding the events that took place in the UN World Water Conference. First, let us know about the conference and then let us discuss the points that are mentioned in the article. See, water is a fundamental part of all aspects of life and water is unavoidably linked to various pillars of sustainable development by integrating social, cultural, economic and political values. So, in the context of a serious environmental issues such as flooding, drought and severity of climate change that are happening across the globe, conservation of water resources has now become a global movement. So in that way, the World Water Conference was organized by the United Nations on March 22nd to 24th of this year. The unique thing about this is that such a World Water Conference is said to be the first UN conference on fresh water in almost 50 years. And let us see the facts about the second UN World Water Conference. See the theme of this conference is our wa watershed moment uniting the world for water. The aim of this conference is to support various stakeholders in achieving water related targets at both global and national levels. So uh, even those goals contained in STG can be achieved within the year 2030. Know that this conference took place in the UN headquarters located in New York. Uh, since this is the second World Water Conference, know that the first water conference got held in the year 1977 in Argentina. In that first water conference itself, many world countries and other stakeholders came up with certain solutions like creating a first global action plan. This global action plan recognized that all people have the right to have access to drinking water in a quality equal to their basic needs. And secondly, the first water conference that got held in the year 1977 established a global funding mechanism and related efforts to provide drinking water and sanitation for all. So these actions led to the reduction in number of people who were without the access of uh, safe and drinking water, especially in developing countries. Now coming to the second World Water Conference that took place in New York, the positive outcome from the conference is the creation of International Water Action Agenda. Through this agenda, several governments, multilateral institutions, businesses and even certain NGOs submitted over 670 commitments to address water security issues. But the thing we must know here is that the commitments made by these many stakeholders are only voluntary in nature. So these are not in any way legally binding on them. So the author says that collective political will is required from these stakeholders. Only then the commitment in the agenda can be put to action at the field level. Then in addition to this, the article lists certain concerns over the commitment made under the International Water Action Agenda. Let us see that one by one. First is about the manner in which the commitments are made. See, firstly, we should know that if there is any particular study based on which these commitments are made, the answer is no. And then there is nothing to prove that these commitments will yield any universal, safe or affordable access to water that is consistent with the SDG 6. Then the second one is regarding the financial requirement needed to implement the commitments that are made. See. Meeting the SDG 6 target by the year 2030 will require capital expenditure of about $114 billion per year. Even if we take the World Bank estimate on recurring operations and maintenance cost 
for basic water and sanitation the estimate cost over 30 billion dollars per year by 2030 so where do we get these funds to operate the agenda that is why even the world resource institute is saying that although the stakeholders are ambitious to fulfill their commitments they lack proper finance and targets that are quantifiable then the third factor is regarding the quantification of targets that i mentioned just now see till now we have not made any efforts to value the water resources at any level do we know the economic value of water resource in india the answer is no nor do we have any data about the economic value of water resources in developed countries the answer is no so there are so these are said to be the various uh, serious limitations in our knowledge about the volume flux and quality of water in lakes rivers soil and aquifers so the valuation of water resources at all levels is the first thing that we should do before fixing targets for water conservation because without knowing the quantity of a thing how could we say whether we saved it or lost it we need uh, numbers of it right so robust water measurement and accounting is what the stakeholders should do as a first measure then the fourth point is about the prioritization of new water infrastructure see from a world bank study we can infer that funding from regional national and international sources prioritize new water infrastructure rather than investing on water maintenance services so the poor maintenance of water assets leads to decreased services for water customers this is a worrying trend as the world bank itself has said uh, operation and maintenance cost for water assets are more than any cost to build a new water infrastructure and the fifth, fifth factor is about the importance given to water resource see water is yet to qualify to become a global public good that is why water is not considered to be an area of urgent funding when compared to climate change and here we must know that as of now the uh, global environment facility is the only international funding mechanism dealing with the water resource management through this funding mechanism the global environment facility has been able to cover more than 300 watersheds and even a uh, greater number of aquifers across political boundaries that is all about the concerns now let us see the role played by india in the second world water conference see india committed to invest around dollar 240 billion in the water sector and uh, india also said it will take efforts to restore groundwater level this commitments come at the time when the cag report has already warned the groundwater extraction in india increased from 58 percentage to 63 percentage between the year 2004 to 17 so within 15 years itself the cag report says uh, groundwater extraction in india has gone up from 58 percentage to 63 percentage earlier as said earlier the commitment made by india is only voluntary in nature so there is no legal pressure in implementing it that is what the author is once again highlighting in the article here he compares the commitments that world countries have made when it comes to climate change while addressing climate change voluntary uh, commitments from these countries took place within a broader context of binding agreements uh, we know right uh, agreements like UNFCCC, Kyoto Protocol and Paris Agreement but this is set uh, such agreements are said to be missing for water conservation then the author says voluntary commitments are becoming an important feature in the environmental law but the accountability factor is questioned because of non-binding nature of those commitments and finally he concludes by highlighting the need for compliance regime so that commitments made by these countries are put to action uh, that is all about this article so in this article we saw about uh, UN World Water Conference and also the concerns uh, raised by the author re regarding the recent events that took place in the conference. With this let us close this topic and move to the second topic. The NPCI's new circular on levy charges. This news article is regarding the circular issued by NPCI. In that circular the NPCI mentioned that banks can levy charges on merchant transactions made through prepaid instrument wallets using UPI. So in this context let us know about NPCI, UPI and prepaid 
instruments from exam point of view. Before that, let us know what the circular is saying. See, as per the circular by NPCI, certain UPI merchant transactions made through prepaid instruments will carry an interchange fee up to 1.1 percentage of the transaction amount. So this interchange fee will be applicable on specified categories of merchants such as online merchants, large merchants and small merchants for transaction of above rupees 2000. This is from uh, this will be applicable from April 1 of this year and the interchange fee will not be applicable to peer to peer transaction or peer to peer merchant transaction. So if someone is sending money to their friends or family members or any other individual then it will not attract an interchange fee. Uh, the P2P merchant is that uh, where the NPCI classified for small businesses which have a projected monthly inward UPI transaction of less than rupees 50,000. This payment will also not attract interchange fee. Only certain merchant payment transactions made by prepaid payment instruments will attract the interchange fee. Wallets, smart cards, vouchers, magnetized chips comes under the prepaid payment instruments and a few example of wallets are like Paytm wallet, phone pay wallet, Amazon pay etc. Now suppose say if you have money in your Paytm or phone pay wallet and you go to a store and scan the QR code and pay it from the wallet if the transaction amount is going to be uh, above 2000 an interchange fee of up to 1.1% will be levied on your transaction. So that is all about the current news. Now let us know about the NPCI in addition to it. See the National Payment Corporation of India is an umbrella organization for operating retail payments and settlement systems in India. Know that it is an initiative of RBI and the Indian Banks Association and it was established under the provisions of Payment and Settlements Act of 2007 for creating a robust payment and settlement infrastructure in India. And know that it has been incorporated as a not-for-profit organization under Companies Act of 2013. There are 10 core promoter banks, promoter banks for NPCI, some of which are like State Bank of India, Bank of Baroda, Canara Bank, etc. Now, uh, we have discussed about NPCI because UPI itself is a product of NPCI only. That is, UPI was created by an institution named NPCI. This NPCI has also produced systems like National Financial Switch, Bharat Bill Payment Systems, National Electronic Toll Collection Program, Other Enabled Payment System, etc. Now, coming to the UPI, that is the Unified Payment Interface, See, the term interface means a connection between two points or a device. Unified payment interface means a medium that connects various bank accounts in a unified mobile application and creating a network between them. To be precise, UPI is a popular mobile payment method that allows you to transfer funds from one bank account to another. And this is done instantly and at free of charge. Ever since its introduction, that is from the year 2016 onwards, UPI has made financial transaction much easier for account holders. Also know that through the uh, UPI, multiple bank accounts are connected to a single mobile application. Most of you might be familiar with the way how Google Pay works, right? We can have multiple bank accounts with the same mobile number and use a particular bank account while we transfer or receive funds. Hence, we can say UPI helps in merging several banking features and provides seamless fund routing and merchant payments into one hood. It also caters to peer-to-peer -to -peer collect request which can be scheduled and paid as per the requirements. The uniqueness about the UPI is that it ensures immediate money transfer through mobile devices round the clock. That is UPI can provide services 24 bar 7 and for all 365 days. As said earlier, it is a single mobile application for accessing different bank accounts. Then another feature about UPI is that the customers are not required to enter the details such as card number, account number, IFSC etc. So only virtual address of the customers are required which can be an incremental security. And then uh, use of QR code for money transfers makes the process smooth and easy. And even donations, collections, disbursements can be done through UPI based apps where the data regarding money transfers 
are also stored to ensure transparency. So that is all about UPI. Now let us see about the prepaid payment instruments in brief. See the prepaid payment instruments or those instruments that facilitate the purchase of goods and services using the values stored on such instruments. The values on them stored on them is paid by the uh, holder using a medium such as cash, debit card, credit card, etc. So these are generally issued in form of smart cards, uh, mobile wallets, paper vouchers, internet accounts or wallets. In short, the PPI are instruments that are with a preloaded value of money. For example, Paytm wallet. Most important from exam point of view is that know that these payment instruments are licensed and regulated by the Reserve Bank of India. And as of now, there are three types of PPI, closed system PPI, semi closed system PPI and an open system PPI. That is all about uh, prepaid payment instrument. So in this article, we saw about the current news and also about the NPCI, UPI and prepaid payment instruments. With this, let us close this topic. Third topic, what is the open source seats movement? This news article is about the open source seats movement. This is a movement that emphasizes on sharing of planned seats without patents or intellectual property restrictions. In addition to it, know that this movement makes plant breeding more accessible and transparent and also enhances crop diversity and climate resilience. And then the article talks about the Plant Variety Protection and Farmers Rights Act 2001. Let us know more about it from the exam point of view. But before that, let us see more about the uh, issues surrounding intellectual property rights and patents. See, as the article says, farmers have innovated and shared seeds without any intellectual property rights for centuries. Indian farmers never sought exclusive rights over seeds and germplasm to prevent others from innovating on the seeds. But taking this as an opportunity, there were many case in, cases in India where foreign firms and individuals have taken rights over these innovative seeds and practices of Indian farmers through their intellectual property regime. Through this, the said rights holders demand royalty on seats and legally enforce intellectual property rights. In some national intellectual property rights regime, right holders can also restrict unauthorized use of seats to develop new varieties. So this is, this is where Indian farmers have lost their rights over their innovative seats and practices. This is where India enacted a legislation titled Plant Variety Protection and Farmers Rights Act 2001 to protect our farmers. In addition to it, we must also know India have signed and ratified the agreement on trade related aspects of intellectual property rights. So India has to make Plant Variety Protection and Farmers Rights Act of 2001 for giving effect to this TRIPS agreement. The act which we are discussing right now, that is the Plant Variety Protection and Farmers Rights Act of 2001 allowed farmers to register farmer variety of seeds if they meet certain conditions. And when they register such seeds, the act provides them to the right to reuse, replant and exchange seeds. But however, the farmers can't breed and trade in varieties pro protected under the act for commercial purposes. In addition to it, the protection of Plant Varieties and Farmers Rights Authority has been set up under the Plant Variety Protection and Farmers Rights Act of 2001. Now let us know about this authority from exam point of view. See the protection of plant varieties and farmers rights authority has its headquarters in New Delhi and the objective of it is to provide for an establishment of effective system in order to protect plant varieties. Then secondly, it also ensures the rights of farmers in return for their contribution made in conserving, improving and making available plant genetic resources for the development of new plant varieties. Then this authority also protects the rights of the plant breeders to encourage investments in R&D for the development of new plant varieties. 
Finally, the authority also encourages the development of new varieties of plants. If we take the general functions of the authority, it performs the function of registration of a new plant varieties, especially derived varieties and extant varieties. Then secondly, they also help in developing distinctiveness, uniformity and stability test guidelines for new plant species. Then the third function is regarding characterization and documentation of various varieties of plants that are registered. Then the authority also functions in a manner of cataloging the varieties of plants that are registered. Then it includes uh, documentation, indexing and cataloging of farmers varieties in order to give protection to plant varieties. Then finally they will also recognize and reward farmers for their contribution in plant gene protection. So that is all about the uh, functions of protection of plant varieties and farmers rights authority. With this let us close this discussion and move to the fourth topic. Fourth topic, lumpy skin disease led to stagnation in milk production, says Center. The news article reports the death of about uh, 1.89 lakh cattle recently because of lumpy skin disease. Such loss of cattle population has led to decrease in milk production in the country. So in this context, let us know about the lumpy skin disease from exam point of view. See the LST that is the lumpy skin disease is caused by lumpy skin disease virus that belongs to capripox virus genus. This virus is a part of pox virid family and smallpox and monkeypox viruses are also a part of the same family only. Know that the lumpy skin disease virus shares antigenic similarities with the sheeppox and the goatpox viruses and at the same time this Lumpy skin disease virus is similar in the immune response to those viruses. Second point, the LST affects the lymph nodes of the infected animal causing the nodes to enlarge and appear like lumps on the skin. You can see the picture here. The nodules may turn into ulcers which can develop scabs over the skin of the cattle. And according to the FAO, the incubation period that is the time between the infection and the symptoms is about 28 days and another important point about the lumpy skin disease is that LST is a non zoonotic disease and therefore it is not unsafe to drink milk from the infected cattle. Moreover a large portion of milk produced is either boiled or pasteurized or dried in order to make the milk powder. This process ensures that the virus is inactivated or destroyed. But why this lumpy skin disease has become a challenge for India? That is because India is the world's largest milk producer and it has also the largest number of cattle and buffalo population worldwide. So the disease has reduced the milk supply which will affect the dairy sector in India and it will also affect the livelihoods of small poultry farmers. So in order to address that, the government is doing uh, and performing certain measures to control the disease. First is that the FAO has suggested a few measures to control the disease. It includes like providing vaccination to cattle with more than 80% coverage. Then the government has also informed that goat pox vaccine is very effective against the lumpy skin disease and as a response to it, this goat pox vaccine is being used across the affected states to contain the spread of virus. Then the affected states has also put bans on the movement of cattle. So they are also isolating infected cattle and buffaloes in order to restrict the spread of virus. Then other measures include like spraying insecticides to kill vectors like mosquitoes etc. Then some affected states are also setting up dedicated control rooms and helpline numbers to guide farmers whose cattle have been infected. And then know that the government has come up with a vaccine named Lumpy Pro-Vac 
ind vaccine see this vaccine is a indigenously developed vaccine against the lumpy skin disease virus know that it is developed by the national research center on equinus and the international veterinary research institute located at izat nagar up uh, when we talk about the type of vaccine it is a live attenuated vaccine similar to those which are used against tb measles mumps and rubella and this vaccine provides 100% protection against the lst in cattle so that is all about the article in this we saw about the lumpy skin disease and also about the newly developed vaccine named lumpy pro vac ind vaccine so with this let us close this topic and move to the final topic of the day fifth topic ifc says to stop funding new coal related infra projects the ifc on its website has mentioned that it will start requiring a commitment from its financial institution clients to not initiate and finance any new coal projects and this is said to be in line with the paris agreement ambitions to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions so in this context let us know about the international financial finance Co corporation from prelims angle see it is an international financial institution which is headquartered in washington dc in united states know that the ifc is a member of world bank group see there are five institutions which are the member of world bank group one is the international bank for reconstruction and development second is the international development association third is the international finance corporation that we are discussing now the fourth one is multilateral investment guarantee agency and the fifth one is the international center for settlement of investment disputes now coming back to the international finance corporation the ifc offers investments advisory and asset management services to the uh, to encourage private sector development especially in the developing countries and know that the ifc was established in the year 1956 as the private sector arm of world bank group this is to advance the economic development and also to invest in strictly profit and commercial projects aiming to reduce poverty and to promote development know that the ifc is owned and governed by its member countries itself but the ifc has its own executive leadership and staffs that conducts its normal business operation besides this the ifc is also a corporation where member governments or its shareholders that provide paid in capital and also has the right to vote on its matters now coming to the roles and functions know that ifc focuses on a set of developmental goals such as to increase sustainable agriculture opportunities improving healthcare and education increasing access to finance for microfinance in addition to it the ifc also helps the business clients and small businesses to grow their revenue and secondly the ifc offers range of debt and equity financing services to help companies that face risk exposures although the interest rates uh, charged by ifc is commercial it is comparatively low this allows the private institutions to reach ifc for financial aid and assistance finally know that the ifc advises government on building infrastructure and partnerships encouraging private sector development so that is all about the international finance corporation from exam point of view with this let us close the news articles discussion and move to the previous year prelims question discussion now of coming to the previous year prelims questions today we will be covering three questions from polity all the three questions were asked in the year 2020 so kindly listen to it first question with reference to the provisions contained in part 4 of the constitution of india which of the following statements is or are correct first statement they shall be enforceable by courts second statement they shall not be enforceable by any court third statement the principles laid down in this part are to influence the making of laws by the state select the correct answer using the code given below the options given are option a one only option b two only option c one and three option d 
2 and 3. See, the part 4 of the constitution here means the directive principles of state policy which are listed in the article 36 to 51. We know that the directive principles of state policy are not enforceable by any courts. So, first statement is wrong. So, by that we can eliminate the option A and option C and we must here know that the principles laid down in the D DPSP are considered in the governance of a country. So, it is the moral duty of the state to apply these principles while enacting laws to establish a just society. So, the third statement is correct. The answer for this question is option D, 2 and 3 only. Moving to the second question, consider the following statements. Statement 1 says, according to the constitution of India, a person who is eligible to vote can be made a minister in a state for six months even if he or she is not a member of the legislature of that state. Statement 2. According to the Representation of People Act 1951, a member convict of, convicted of a criminal offence and sentenced to an imprisonment for five years is permanently disqualified from contesting an election even if even after his release from prison. Which of the statements given above is or are correct? The options given are option A, 1 only, option B, 2 only, option C, both 1 and 2, option D, neither 1 nor 2. See, the first statement says, uh, a person who is eligible to vote can become a minister in a state. This statement is wrong because the eligible age to vote is 18, but to become a minister, the age required is 25. So, the first statement is wrong. Then the second statement says according to RPA Act of 1951, a person convicted of criminal offence and sentenced to imprisonment for 5 years is permanently disqualified. This is also wrong because according to this act, if a person is convicted and sentenced to more than 2 years, then they shall be disqualified in contesting from contesting elections for 6 years since their release. So, they are not permanently disqualified, but they are disqualified for from contesting elections for 6 year period. So, the correct answer for this question is option D, neither 1 nor 2. Uh, then let us see uh, some other qualifications uh, to become eligible for a minister. First is that uh, a person should be a citizen of India. Then second, uh, he or she should not hold any office of profit under the government of India. Then, if a person is not a member of parliament, then he or she should be elected to Lok Sabha or to Rajya Sabha within 6 months from the date he or she is appointed as a minister. So, that is what the constitution says. Now, moving to the third question. Third question, consider the following statements. The first statement says, the president of India can summon a session of the parliament at such place as he or she thinks fit. This statement is correct. Second statement, the constitution of India provides for three sessions of the parliament in a year, but it, but it is not mandatory to conduct all three sessions. It says constitution of India provides three sessions. This is wrong because it is by the parliamentary conventions that three sessions of the parliament are held in a year. So, the second statement is wrong. If we take the uh, second statement out, option B and option D can be eliminated. The third statement says there is no minimum number of days that the parliament is required to meet in a year. This is also correct statement. So, the answer for this question is option C, 1 and 3 only. So, with this we have come to the end of the uh, topics, news topics and the previous year question discussion. So, with this let us wind up the discussion. Uh, if you like the way I am teaching and if you can understand the concepts well, please give a like, share and subscribe to Forum IAS in various social media platforms for a further update.